Hello, everybody. Um, I am Nisa Marks. I'm the watershed coordinator at DES. Uh, the majority of my role is to be a general point of contact for lake associations on whatever topics you are currently thinking about or working on. Um, so I work on a little bit of everything from cyanobacteria to watershed-based planning um, to brainstorming with you around membership or other concerns of the lake association. Um, so please feel free to reach out at any point in time. Um, Kate did a great job giving an overview of sort of the basics of cyanobacteria and sort of our rapid response program uh, to cyanobacteria blooms. Um, I'm going to pick up where she left off and cover, okay, our lake now has regular blooms. Now what do we do? What do we do about this? Um, and talk a little bit about uh, prevention and management. Um, so like Kate said, blooms look have all sorts of different appearances. Uh, basically, if you see something that looks abnormal, stay out of the lake. When in doubt, stay out. Um, keep your dogs out, keep your children out, keep, keep everybody safe and, and free of toxins. Um, someone asked about the link um, to access the reporting form. It is now online. This is the uh, link for that. That will be on the next slide and my last slide as well, if you're interested in copying it down. Um, why prevent blooms? There are lots of reasons why it's easier to address root causes, even though it is very difficult to address root causes, than it is to manage blooms once they're occurring. Um, blooms threaten public health, as Kate mentioned, with the toxins. Um, they impede recreation, which is a big part of why we enjoy our lakes and come to them. Uh, they harm wildlife. She mentioned fish kills. Um, there are other impacts to wildlife as well. Um, we see effects to business revenues. You know, people don't want to go to um, the lakeside dining uh, if there's an advisory in place. Um, Short-term rental impacts. Um, there are some pretty significant uh, loss of business seen in states with more severe blooms than what we yet have in New Hampshire. Um, and then we also know that there's a direct relationship between cyanobacteria blooms and decreases in property values. Um, so some lakes that have chronic cyanobacteria blooms, and we're talking about it, you know, bloom conditions for over 100 days, um, have seen up to a 30% decrease in property values. It's not the case everywhere, uh, but it can impact um, property values in a significant way. So. This is part of our reality. It's becoming an increasing part of our reality. What do we do about it? Um, I'm gonna talk about three areas here. Uh, first, a little bit about what causes blooms, what the major drivers of blooms are. A lot of that conversation is gonna focus on uh, nutrients. Um, then I'll go into a section about what lake associations specifically uh, can be doing to address nutrient pollution. Uh, and then touching briefly on some resources that are available to help both homeowners who want to take action now on their own property uh, and also resources for lake associations uh, to do some nutrient reduction work. Um, so talking about the drivers of blooms, this is a little bit overly simplistic, but the basic idea holds true. Um, blooms form when cyanobacteria have access to sunlight Excess nutrients above natural conditions, particularly phosphorus, and New Hampshire phosphorus is usually the limiting uh, nutrient for growth, and warm water temperatures. And when you get these in the right combination, you're likely to see a bloom. Um, most of this presentation is going to focus on nutrients, but I'm going to take a brief detour uh, into this warm water temperatures. Um, because this is one of the ways that we use your VLAP data at a statewide level. So in addition to having VLAP give really useful water quality data about your individual water body, it also gives us really important information at the state about sort of statewide what's going on uh, in our lakes and what does it, that mean for lake management. Um, and so we have seen an increase in 
surface water body temperatures, lake water body, lake water temperatures um, over the last couple of decades uh, based on uh, the 180 lakes that are in VLAP. Um, climate change is expected to, you know, continue to make this worse, uh, which in turn increases the likelihood of blooms. Um, the decreasing length of period when lakes are iced in that Sarah mentioned in her graph um, is also increasing the likelihood of blooms. It's essentially extending the growing season. Um, these don't guarantee that we're going to see blooms, but they contribute to the likelihood of blooms. Um, so this is really useful data for us to understand what's going on and what factors are contributing to and driving um, cyanobacteria bloom frequency and severity in New Hampshire. Okay, back to the major drivers of blooms. Uh, for the rest of this, I'm gonna focus on phosphorus in particular. Um, when we think about where phosphorus comes from, Yes, there's some of it that is naturally occurring in the landscape through atmospheric deposition and so forth. Um, however, the vast majority of phosphorus that's ending up in our lakes today is coming from human-caused activities. Um, so you've heard some of us today, uh, development, um, in increase in impervious surfaces, everything from roofs to roads, um, Septic systems, if you are, you know, there are a surprising number of lakes that still have a barrel in the ground rather than a functioning septic system that uh, can, can be a source of nutrients. Applying fertilizers uh, that, contain fer um, that contain phosphorus when it rains, all of these things wash into the lake. So when the rain falls on impervious surfaces, um, they the rain water travels at a higher and higher um, speed across the landscape, it starts to erode the soil. The soil has nutrients in it and that runoff um, ends up in the lake carrying those nutrients into the lake as well. So there's not a good way to think about phosphorus in a lake without also thinking about the watershed around the lake. Um, once that phosphorus is in the lake, it becomes available essentially as food for cyanobacteria growth, for algae growth, uh, for weed growth um, that we sometimes hear about, you know, folks who are concerned about swimming and so forth. Um, phosphorus is driving a lot of that growth. It also can settle down into the sediments um, where when it, anoxic conditions occur, uh, the phosphorus is then released from the sediments and again, becomes available to, to fuel blooms. So the bottom line here is because we're thinking about, we can't think about the phosphorus in the lake without thinking about the watershed. This means that there's not a quick, easy, cheap, long-term solution to um, cyanobacteria blooms. In order to reduce the likelihood of blooms, we have to take on the difficult task of thinking about what's going on in our watershed that's affecting the health of the lake. So what can lake associations be doing to help address nutrient pollutions? First off, stormwater management. You've heard some great examples um, in Lisa's presentation earlier today. There's lots of different things that go into stormwater management. It's really site specific where problems are. Um, okay. Um, in some cases, we see that road grading is a problem. You know, we, we can work with towns and lake associations to grade roads away from the road, away from the lake instead of towards the lake so that runoff ends up in a vegetated area where um, it can be absorbed into the ground held, held in place rather than running off into the, um, into the lake. Um, culverts, in some areas there are culverts where with every storm you get a big washout that include, that delivers um, sediment plumes into the lake. Um, that's that's an issue as well. Um, Lisa talked about a bunch of DIY solutions. Um, lake associations can help spread the word about those and also uh, put on demonstration projects, organize an effort around the watershed to identify where the sources of these uh, st stormwater issues are um, and so forth. So, um, Lots of different forms of stormwater management, all of which are important and all of which lake associations can be involved um, in addressing. Okay, but now I can't advance my slides. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, 
The second thing is to protect the shorelands. Um, how do we do that? So we don't want things like this picture where when it rains on this hill slope, hill slope that's been clear cut, again, that sediment is just gonna wash right into the lake. And that doesn't benefit anyone, including the home, this homeowner over the long term. Um, we encourage the use of native plants. Um, so native plants tend to have much deeper root systems than non-native plants or horticultural plants, or certainly than lawns. Those deeper roots hold soil in place and they absorb more water. Um, and so when you get a big rain event, you have both the more water uptake by those plants and those root systems help hold that soil in place. This ends up helping both with stormwater reduction and nutrient pollution, um, as we're focused on here. It also benefits um, in terms of reducing ice damage, um, which can be an issue at some lakes. Um, there are lots of other uh, benefits to native plants as well. Um, they are much more nutritious um, and support much higher native biodiversity, uh, the wildlife that many of us enjoy watching at our lakes. Um, and our native plants are adapted to this landscape. They don't tend to need fertilizer. Um, and again, if you aren't applying fertilizer, that fertilizer isn't running off into the lake where it can um, fuel uh, cyanobacteria algae weeds. There are a variety of other of ways to protect shorelands. Um, one of the big ones that I'll talk a little bit more later um, is that lake associations are great at education and outreach. Neighbors talking to neighbors about why what you do on your property impacts the health of the lake and therefore things like property values. Um, we also see that land, lake associations can play an important role in land conservation. Um, getting easements in place, um, working with conservation commissions, um, being an active voice in permit review as needed. The, the role varies from lake to lake, um, but playing a role in land conservation. Um, there's also a lot on the policy side to shoreland protection. Um, so we do see some towns choosing to enact uh, local ordinances that are more protective of shorelands than the statewide standard um, the, that Rosemary spoke about earlier. Um, these shoreland buffer zones can apply to everything from um, septic systems like the ordinance just passed by Sunapee um, to uh, development to vegetation within this, this um, shoreland buffer. Um, and so you, lake associations can be an important role in stepping up and describing the problem um, to a select board or a conservation commission uh, and working to get additional protections in place at the local level. Uh, Rosemary also talked briefly about uh, the local role in shoreland permit enforcement. Um, you know, you are eyes and ears on the ground um, and often it is municipalities who are um, faster to respond when there is a permit violation um, that where a local permit was issued as well. Lastly, I'll mention, you know, every year there are lots of bills filed in the legislature that the state legislature uh, that have to do with wetlands and shorelands protections. Um, and lake associations can be an important voice in utilizing protection um, between water quality that you care about through you to your lake um, and uh, the bills that, that are affecting shorelands. Again, the bottom line here is if we want to reduce runoff to reduce nutrient pollution to the lake to reduce the likelihood of future cyanobacteria. This doesn't take the likelihood to zero. This is not a guaranteed fix. This is a necessary step, but not always a sufficient step. You're not necessarily going to see results overnight, but this is the root cause in most cases. Um, and so if you really want to you know, tackle the long-term health of your lake, this is the way to go. Um, and ultimately it's protecting, you know, the lakes that we love and the values that bring us to those lakes. Um, the third piece of what lake associations can do is education and outreach. Um, mo many people are not aware that what they do on their property or in their home can affect water quality. Um, and so simply spreading that message describing the results that you're seeing over your long-term monitoring um, through VLAP, um, spreading the word of 
you know, getting a bunch of neighbors organized together to, um, you know, do to, to do native plantings along the shoreline, for example, or something like that. Um, you know, make it into a community thing. Neighbors talking to neighbors really is the the most effective way. Um, you know, we do see lake associations engaged on all four of these topics that I mentioned here: shoreland vegetation, stormwater runoff, fertilizer use, septic maintenance. Different lakes feel compelled to take on different topics. All of these are, are good contributions to spreading awareness and, and hopefully changing action and inspiring, um, inspiring homeowners. The other piece that's really important, um, you know, Kate talked about uh, risk assessment and looking at your lake and saying, does this look normal or is it, you know, green and blue and weird, or sorry, green and, and you know, looks like spilled paint and all of that. Um, spread the word about how to identify cyanobacteria, the risks associated with it, and how to report it. And here's that, that link again to report blooms. Um, the last piece that I'll, I'll talk about uh, around action plan is to create and implement a watershed-based plan. Basically, a watershed-based plan is a prioritized to-do list that describes all of the types of action I've already mentioned here. Um, it will go through the process of preparing the plan. Well, you'll go through the watershed and look at all of your major sources of nutrients, quantify how much nutrients are coming from that source. And that'll give you a list that says, all right, we've got one big problem area. This is where we can put our bank and get a big bang for our buck, right? Um, versus, ah, We've got a bunch of small sources, but lots of them. Um, those are very different action plans. Um, and so this, the process of preparing a watershed-based plan will give you quantified data to guide your investment into the next steps of how to protect, how to take action that really does uh, end up improving your water quality, uh, including reducing the likelihood of future cyanobacteria blooms. Um, the other advantage of watershed-based planning um, is that they are required to get um, one of the major sources of funding for implementing the types of work that I've talked about so far, um, and called se Section 319 funding. Um, basically, we are looking to guide our investment of state grant dollars um, to those projects that are that are highly effective. And so we require a watershed-based plan before giving those implementation dollars to like usually to lake associations. Um, sometimes municipalities are involved as well. Um, some of you have heard discussion of in-lake treatment. Um, this is an emerging area. Um, it is not a replacement for going through this watershed-based planning process. Um, we will want to see lakes um, engaged in data collection of the sort that's associated with watershed place planning, as well as making a good faith effort to be working on these root causes uh, of cyanobacteria blooms. Uh, resources to help with all of this process, because some of this is a, is, is a lot of undertaking. Um, resources for homeowners, you heard Lisa's presentation around Soak Up the Rain, which is a DES program. Um, to provide essentially technical assistance for DIY projects um, to reduce stormwater impacts. Um, I'll also highlight the Lake Smart program, which is run by New Hampshire Lakes. Um, it is a free, entirely voluntary, non-regulatory program uh, where a qualified expert will come out to your property, walk through it with you, um, and talk through what you can do to improve um, your management of your own property. Uh, and then it's up to you to choose to implement those recommendations. Um, those people who are already um, do, living in a lake friendly way are recognized with a Lake Smart Award. Um, so, two great programs to help individuals. Um, and we also sometimes see lake associations who will organize an entire community and you know, have someone have a Lake Smart Assessor come out. Uh, and do, you know, eight properties around the lake in a day or spend a week around the lake and go through um, many properties and it becomes an organized effort um, that, that builds community and increases people's emotional investment um, in protecting the lake together. 
Um, we have for on the Lake Association side, uh, we do have both uh, grants and loans available to help support the watershed based planning and implementation process. Um, it is a complex and lengthy undertaking. Uh, we recognize that we have full time staff who work full time uh, just on providing um, these financial resources and walking people through the process. Um, so we are happy to meet with you regularly um, and, and step you through the process. Um, as I mentioned, I'm also sort of a general point of contact for Lake Associations at DES. I'm always happy to help you brainstorm uh, around these issues. Um, either in providing technical assistance or in helping connect you to the right person within DES if you're not sure who to talk with about um, these types of issues. Um, so I'm going to wrap up just uh, by talking a little bit briefly um, about the cyanobacteria plan um, that Dave mentioned in his opening uh, today as well. Cyanobacteria is complex. Right? Like we've been putting extra nutrients into our lakes for 100 years or more. Um, there's, this is not an overnight transformation of the landscape. We do expect blooms to become more frequent and more severe. Um, so we recognize that and are working at a statewide level to figure out how we can um, support the folks who are dealing with this on the ground. Um, and come up with, you know, effective statewide programs uh, to address cyanobacteria blooms. Um, and all of that will be described um, in this plan, which will be uh, final by November 1st of this year. Um, it is complex. It is, it is a challenging issue to deal with. Um, but uh, we do what we can, and we aim to support you doing what you can um, at the local level as well. Um, so I don't know where we stand on, on time, but I am happy to take questions or be available to chat 